Why are we wrapping a salad in a material that lasts for 400 years? Mm. The owners of the boat that I was working on, they actually bought over a thousand Evian bottles for their family that Christmas. They would take a sip and then I'd leave it out on the deck and I'd have to like pour out this water that had been flowed in from the Alps. I could see the island in the distance that was just like burning and, and smoldering. So they burn all the plastic waste and it just drifts off into the ocean. What does leadership mean to you? Allowing people to believe the more is possible. Everyone has their down times. How do you maintain that energy when you might not feel like it? Those bad times, you've got to embrace them and just like roll with them. When this is over, it's over. It's over. So if people don't change their behavior, how long will it take? The rate of plastic flowing into the ocean is accelerating. The problem is getting much worse, much faster. Quick question. When did you discover that you're a leader? that your actions matter to those that look up to you. You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening, and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. So, Will and Nick, thank you so much for coming on to Anatomy of a Leader. Welcome. Um, so good to have you here. Thank you for, yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. You are both founders of this fantastic business called Ocean Bottle. And I'd love for you to tell me what inspired you to start the business, what it's about, and what's the world problem that you're trying um, to solve. Well, luckily we actually managed to room to bring an ocean hole today. So that's, that was always helpful. A win too. A real win. And we've got a lovely tea here. So thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, well, it, it all started a few years back. And I think inspiration often comes from a few different places. So it wasn't just like one thing. Um, so I suppose my half of the coin, because it's like a two-sided coin of, of story here. Um, so I, I'd... Um, uh, studied engineering and then I decided to spend a year working on a boat um, out in the Indian Ocean. I'd always like had a real passion for the ocean and wanted to go out there. Um, and when we got out to the Maldives, so the owners of the boat that I was working on, they actually bought over a thousand Evian bottles for their family that Christmas. And they were like wow. a family of four people. Uh, and they would take a sip and then I like, leave it out on the deck and I'd have to like pour out this water that had been flowed in from the Alps. Uh, and then literally hand it over to someone to take it off. And I could see the island in the distance that was just like burning and, and smoldering. So they burn all the plastic waste and it just drifts off into the ocean. So that was one key inflection point for me, I think, in terms of our journey. Um, so yeah, I learned a bit about the ocean plastic crisis and found out it's pretty bad. And we can be you know, happy to get a bit more into that. But really wanted to do something about it. Um, so when I came back to London, I met Nick and we met in the yeah, lecture, what was First it? day, First day, yeah. First day of London Business School. We were doing a master's in management in, in 2017. Yeah. 2017, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sort of hard to always remember. It's very straight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so um, yeah, we met on the first day and we allocated seats next to each other in the, in the lecture theater, which was serendipitous. I mean, it's pretty wild that I mean it's so we were the first people that each other met on the course and you know I think we just started getting talking about all these sort of ideas about what we wanted to do after the course uh what companies we, we might want to start what really got us out of bed in the morning you know what uh causes that we were thinking about getting involved in because I think it was quite clear that both of us wanted to get into sustainability and environmentalism um at that time and my part of the story was really about uh business for good and you know what could business as the fastest moving stakeholder in society really do for the planet because you know in capitalism free market capitalism um that has been taken you know to the nth degree 
for so many you know centuries the planet has really not been uh, and externalities to do with business have not really been taken into consideration mm -hmm. so without government or being you know moving fast enough to regulate and without consumers really being able to you know drive uh businesses to to make that change with the with their wallet um you know i really thought that business needs to take a lead and you know that all these concepts about you know business or profit over purpose um didn't really sit well with me it's sort of you know why why are those two things mutually exclusive why why is it one or the other um why can't it be business um with purpose comes uh profit and you know change that paradigm and you know that's what we really set out to achieve i mean the first thing we decided to do um was before we even had a product was collect a thousand plastic bottles and weights um as the sort of core proposition that we wanted to take to to consumers because we knew that would motivate people to to get involved in the cause and then you know well thought in the lbs uh, canteen um <laughs> you know was looking at a plastic bottle and like, why, why couldn't it be a, a reusable bottle you know something that's so obviously connected to people's desire to uh, reduce their own plastic consumption why can't we a thousand x that at first purchase and really make a difference where it counts you know in these coastal communities around the world uh, where plastic. did you have a moment yourself where you either you know like going out and like seeing how many plastic bottles are just being like basically like burnt was there a pivotal moment for you or why did you decide that this is important to you yeah so i think for me it was really you know what could we what could we do to drive that change with this sort of business model mm -hmm. and like how can we actually just make uh, a business business's success commercial success uh, really linked towards the impact that it makes and so we've um you know by selling more product we collect more plastic it's directly correlated mm -hmm. we've guaranteed that 15 percent of our revenue um will go to plastic collection that's 15 times one percent for the planet so you know 15 times the gold standard that was um you know common before we existed but yeah. um but that already feels out of date that one percent for the planet just isn't enough so that mm -hmm. that was my side my dad is australian so always grew up swimming in the oceans in australia but also my mom was canadian and you know the lakes in canada so the, you know the water and nature has always been a big part of my life but i remember grow up, growing up you know you'd go swimming and you know i didn't remember seeing any piece of plastic mm -hmm. growing up but now that that plastic is hitting such critical mass that i haven't been swimming in the last decade without seeing a piece of plastic mm -hmm. and it's getting and you know it's you're now noticing huge volumes of plastic on every beach you know no matter where you are and in in the water so um i think that every it's just becoming so commonplace to see it and be you know the, mm -hmm. i think people in the sort of worldwide psyche i think people know that plastic is a real issue and in a way, I you know, I had a very similar experience in that I was I was lucky. So I'm, I'm half Norwegian, and so I grew up a while in in like uh, in Norway. Um, and like the fjords are just pristine, uh, and and you know it's 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 in like amazing nature. Um, and the reality now is that yeah, ocean plastics expected to quadruple in the next two decades, uh, which is something that a lot of people aren't aware of. Uh, but there is a real opportunity to actually reduce the flow of plastic up by like by up to 80 percent in those in these next two decades mm -hmm. and that's really what we're trying to try and pack and, and work on um I think, yeah i think i i no, i was just going to say that I've, I've really agreed with you know with nick's perspective on it was kind of like how you know we live in a capitalist world how can we leverage capitalism to like do good mm -hmm. is the engine it runs everything you know, we can't, we're not going to become politicians and, and change that overnight. Those people have tried. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's, let's use business because we know it works. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of the idea. Let's, you know, scale this up and really make a difference. I mean, mm -hmm. in many ways you've had like business destroying the planet and then like charities loosely trying to patch things up mm -hmm. and it hasn't been working too well. So I think we need to do something in this way if you can't beat them join them you're talking about these crazy statistics about how it quadrupling in how long in the next two decades in two decades 2040 you're going to the supermarket i get very upset when you know the whole like 5p charge on plastic bags came in and all of a sudden i'm the one who's being penalized why do supermarkets stop producing these plastic bags or 
any providers of you know fruit and vegetables that are packaging these you know things in in plastic or constantly i feel somewhat annoyed with the fact that as a customer it seems like it's my fault as opposed to the businesses that profit from individuals buying their unbruised strawberries and raspberries or whatever who does the responsibility lie from your perspective i mean it's a fantastic question i think you know from our side it's, it's very clear it's incredibly difficult mm -hmm. for individuals to actually be sustainable like in in today's world um there's the war against convenience because like convenience always wins so that's a diff that's a difficult battle in, in its own right uh, but even if you're trying to do the sustainable thing, if you bring, you know, your tote bag to the supermarket, you'll still fill it with products that are wrapped in plastic. Um, so I think our, our view on this is really that business needs to make the change and actually make it possible for people to be sustainable. You know, this equates to so many different areas. You can buy, um, you know, you can buy a, a, a piece of food that's deforested the Amazon. Mm -hmm. Um you can you can't fill up your bottle anywhere you know we've literally just gone out of the campaign actually today around the lack of refill publicly available refill locations around london and that's the same for many many cities around the world so i think business uh government needs to make it possible for people to be sustainable and that's really where the responsibility lies um and then it's up to yeah people to people to adopt that but the encouraging thing i think that we do see is like individuals putting that pressure on businesses to change you know they want to buy from more sustainable brands but again it can't you know cost five times as much because how are we gonna possibly get everyone to, to adopt it mm. um so yeah there's amazing stuff going on and yeah. it does fill us with hope but mm. yeah let's be done yeah i think it's one of the most you know whose trade-offs yeah. are all across environmentalism and all the movements and it's just incredibly difficult. Plastic in particular, I think, is particularly difficult because mm -hmm. it's a wonder material. It's, it's allowed humankind to do so much stuff. It allows us to transport vaccines, create mobile phones and democratize communication. You know, elongate the time that food can be on the shelf, reducing food waste. I mean, it is incredible. And that those, you know, benefits are now permeating across the whole world. But from inventions that have been made you know, in countries like the UK, there's now on com countries and companies within countries like the UK to figure it out and to figure out the solution and really, mm. you know, because it, it will be expensive. There, there is a lot of R&D needed to, to replace single-use plastic. Mm. Um, but, you know, a lot of the issues, a lot of ocean plastic is not from places like the UK because we manage our waste. We Our bins are collected once or twice a week. Mm. There's some places... And, you know, in the places like that we collect in Indonesia, Philippines, Ghana, Egypt, Brazil, that don't have waste management or have less waste management, that this, you know, plastic curse, but also miracle that has been imparted on them by the West um, is, is making its way into the ocean. And, you know, it, it is on us to figure it out. So are you saying that in order to at least partially solve the problem is by creating circularity of the plastic as in it's okay if we produce a lot of it as long as we recycle it and put it back into you know functioning and having a second life a third life etc so to to simplify the solution as much as possible because it's way more convenient i'm sure yes <laughs> um on the one hand yeah we need to you know almost eradicate single-use plastics it's basically like material applications where hey, why are we wrapping a salad in a material that lasts for 400 years? Mm. That just doesn't make sense. Mm. So so we need to cut down, so we do need to cut down on production massively um, because also we've we've got enough plastic material out there in the world to satisfy our needs, you know, many, many times over. So that's, you know, where we get to the circularity solution. So yeah, so that's the one side of the solution. And the other side is, yeah, we need to close what's called the collection gap mm. um, and actually ensure that this plastic waste that is out there because even if we get rid of single-use plastics there'll still be loads of plastics in circulation mm. that that is collected that it doesn't end up in waterways uh, pouring into the ocean and, and actually polluting people's local environment as well i mean no one wants to live in 
in literally mounds of, of plastic waste. Um, so that really is is a big part of the solution. So for us, um, you know, we're really focused on actually scaling up waste management infrastructure in coastal communities around the world because we can make a huge and direct impact through doing that. Um, so we've now uh, found a collection of over 9 million kilograms of plastic to date. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, but hopefully we're just getting started. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's really cool about this is we're, we're actually setting up collection points um, for you know waste material. People can then come and bring their plastic waste and exchange that for money, but they also get access to loads of other social resources. So there's a huge environmental impact, obviously, of reducing the plastic waste in the environment in the first place. But then also socially, it's yeah, it can be a real game changer as well. That must be so complicated because not only is it the actual infrastructure that you're dealing with, but it's also the cultural differences and you know how does each country even perceive the waste and yeah. when they sit around the table and how they consume the food and how they you know socialize. All of that feeds into what they do with the waste product afterwards. So seems hugely complicated. Well. Yeah, I mean, lucky for us, we work with loads of amazing partner organizations. So I think if we were doing all the work ourselves, we would have probably killed these. <laughs> uh, but no, we work with these amazing partner organizations who have like, they have local knowledge of exactly as you say, like the cultural um, uh, differences, the differences in, in geography in terms of, you know, what plastic is already being collected and what plastic isn't being collected. So there's so many different local nuances that, that really need to be taken into account mm -hmm. that's kind of how we we cater for that um but yeah it's it's otherwise it'd be very very complex and very difficult mm. and in the uk so say you know an average person what can they do to i suppose support your mission um i'm not going to say two things again because i was at that last time um but i think yeah for us it's probably i mean, i'd probably say yeah, get involved join our community um, you know, we've got an amazing community now of, of I think, almost 700,000 people, if not more, that have got, you know, armed to the teeth with ocean bottles. Uh, but then also businesses, you know, we really rely on the support of companies to, to engage, you know, their stakeholders, their employees with, with what we do. I don't know what else you think. Um, and we, we're launching with brands. So the plastic collection that we do, we've got a tracking and traceability platform that basically tells everyone, in our community uh, what impact they made on to a very uh, granular level we can tell everyone where all their thousand plastic bottles in weight it is in weight it's not all plastic bottles but uh was collected and we've got a platform uh that will tell them that and we're also allowing other brands to tap into our plastic collection network and do the same sort of programs with their customers and their their community um i think i think one of the big things that you can do as an individual is really lobby government because I think what we we kind of have left, mm. we've uh, allowed the government <laughs> to get away with quite a lot today because we haven't actually really discussed. I mean, the, the campaigns around banning the plastic straw and banning the plastic bag or, or charging for plastic bag was outrageous. I mean, it was, you know, pulling the wool over all our eyes and really, you know, it was championed as a massive win, but mm. you know, such a small part of plastic usage, single use plastic usage in the UK. And, you know, I think that, gave this government a lot of space to sort of back off and not really think about it again for a while. And actually so much more is needed in terms of regulation. And also, you know, there needs to be a bit of carrot from individuals on business, but also a bit of stick from from government to, you know, to move the conversation along and to drive uh, action. So I think, you know, lobbying government is, is such a crucial part of this. So with that, we're going out with a pen petition, uh, I believe this week or next week. So we, you can sign that yes. for starters. Sure. And that's just a really focused campaign. Uh, London has less refill stations than ancient Rome had. So we're talking, <laughs> you know, over a thousand uh, mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, and London's eight times the size. So it is actually just an outrage. I think we take buying bottled water for granted. Mm -hmm. And it's just one of, by Nick said, many plastic issues. But we're going, you know, we should have access to, to we're fortunate in this country that we have safe drinking water. Everyone here should have access to, to free public water. So mm. yeah, look out on our website on oceanbottle.co for the petition, which is going live soon. Mm. How long have you been doing Ocean Bottle for now? Good question. I mean, there's how many launches have we had? <laughs> well, we started, we met each other in November, September 2017. Yeah. Yeah. 
we went to go design the bottle in April 2018, and we incorporated in March 2018. And then it was a year late, just under a year late that we launched. So it was end of January 2019. That was when we went public mm. on Kickstarter, basically, like a uh, product crowdfunding. Mm. And then it took us, I think we promised to deliver the products in about four four months or something. How was that? It, us, it didn't take us quite a year, but it was it was close. Mm. It took a while. I think at the time that felt, we felt like we were letting everyone down, the world was crumbling down, but in hindsight. Right, actually, people are quite forgiving. Yeah, and people exactly. were really happy that, yeah, so people were really happy. challenge? So you said four months and, and it took a year, you said. So you basically, we decided that like, we're going to design the bottles. We, we had a design agency in Norway, uh, to which we're forever grateful because they, they did the whole design and, you know, we still haven't even paid them back for that design because it was through a really generous mm-hmm. agreement. Um, and yes, yeah, so they spend like a year designing it. And then we basically decided, and Nick and I said to each other, like, if, if we can't sell 5,000 of these, we're just going to pack it in. Like that's going to be it. It's make or break. So it's a product crowd fun. We launch and then we went for it. So it's like a pre-ordering in a way. And then we, I think we promised that they were going to get them a few months later. And then, you know, the reality is it takes a little bit longer. It took ages. And the design agency is called K8. So yes. a quick shout out to them because um, I would recommend them to anyone who's thinking about designing a product. Mm-hmm. So 2017, you know, kind of like bright eyed, bushy tailed. Mm-hmm. What are the misconceptions you've had about starting an impact business? Like looking back now. Oh, everything. Literally. I mean, we went into this so naive. Yeah. I which, do, which I do think was actually a good thing. A good thing. Yeah. Like a really good thing. Especially when you're going to a new space or trying to create a space. I think we've, you know, this sort of impact product space didn't really exist. And um, that naivety just allowed us to push the boundaries and really, mm-hmm. you know, I think one of our mentors, one of our first mentors uh, said, guys, you know, collect 100 plastic bottles. Why are you doing 1,000? No one's even doing 10. Why, why would you do 1,000 and, you know, increase your costs so much? And immediately we looked at each other and we're like, this guy's... Ben, ben him. yeah we you know we didn't speak to him again because we were like he just doesn't get it mm-hmm. you know he, from his point of view he had a point but if we you know if we'd you know i think it was one of the best decisions we ever made was mm-hmm. that thousand plastic bottles and really you know forcing the business model to to take the strength take quite a big strain in terms of how much impact it needed to be able to take on and i think you know it's everything to us mm-hmm. and that, that naivety just really allowed us to to push those boundaries and I think, I think in a way it manifests itself in so many other areas as well, because we hadn't done it before because we didn't have the knowledge. I mean, I remember we thought that we could kind of achieve everything overnight. In four months. It's exactly, right? You, know, yeah. you, you honestly think you can do anything and you, you, know, you quickly realize, okay, we've got no resource whatsoever other than the two of us. So it's really, really hard because you have to do absolutely everything yourself. From literally customer support, thank you, Nick, for a lot of the help there, uh, mm-hmm. to like, yeah, I mean, apps, sales, of you know, I remember I was down the warehouse, like yeah. testing, but we had like leaking bottles, which was a nightmare. I honestly thought, and you know, you th- something happens, and the company's so fragile at that stage, that you just you feel like everything is going to collapse, and yeah. the, the, your world is just going to implode. And now it's it's better because you know we can take the old earthquake as long as we're not like ripped to scale. Yeah, you get used to it a little bit. Yeah, but bit. talking about that about feeling like it's going to implode, well, we obviously didn't. So why at that point, you know, talking about like leaking bottles, why do you think it didn't implode? Um, you know, I think we we were you know when those issues arose, like we were like we you know we need to sort this. Well, we didn't sit around. You know. Just complete buy-in. Like, you know, there there is no option of failure. Yeah. I think it's just everything, you know, I think the first batch of bottles, so many of them leaked. Um, you know, <laughs> if, you know, that that obviously was a big, big deal. But so that was the time when you were on the phone with customer service dealing with that business. Yeah. yeah, so we we had an advisor, and, you know, he was a very sweet, lovely guy, um, very accomplished, you know, we had run and started, founded three household name companies and uh, he, I gave him a bottle and he was looking to invest and I, you know, he stopped replying on the investment emails and I was like, okay, well, you know, 
okay, maybe it's just gone cold. And then he followed up maybe a month later and was like, can I buy 48 more bottles? And I was like, okay, well, you know, he's clearly seen something. And then he called me after those 48 bottles were delivered. And he said, Nick, um, your first bottle that you, that you gave me was uh, leaked into my briefcase, ruined my laptop and all my papers for the week. <laughs> I was like, why did you come back so and buy more bottles? More yeah. He was like, why did you come back and buy 48 more bottles? And he said, you know, I waited a month and I knew you would have fixed it by then. Mm. So he was like, you know. I'm happy, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think well, those bottles were fine. Then. Yeah, those bottles were fine. they come back fixed or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I think they were. Um, and he's happy. He's, he's, he's come back for a few more rounds, which is, mm. which is yeah. good. But there were, I mean, there were countless things like that when they're all the time just mm. throughout the journey, I think. I mean, and there's also, you know, there's to your point about, you know, feeling like you can achieve anything. Like one of our first customers, like our third customer was Ed Sheeran. And for his oh. his European tour, mm-hmm. we sold him 168 bottles, and we were like, we've made it, you know. <laughs> we yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Next thing is like, you know, Brad Pitt's gonna buy 10,000. Final, and the next level, but some kind of you really did have all these moments yeah. where you know you think you think, oh, this we made it. This is the moment of success, and then actually nothing yeah. happens yeah. but yeah. as long as you've got to have hundreds of those moments to actually build in momentum yeah i think yeah and it kind of keeps you going i mean i remember we had the all these exciting that was for me big i think mm. both of us these exciting partnership conversations mm. you know where you're talking to them and you can just see the potential of like what this could be and then in the end, you know, for whatever reason, it doesn't end up materializing either because we're both terrible at closing uh deals um and and but it the, you know still those conversations keep you going and then in the end perhaps you do come back to the year later and then it does materialize which yeah. is which is awesome mm. but yeah i mean there's been so many stories of of uh you know getting our hopes up and then sort of things falling through but then also them coming coming through mm-hmm. and then you think it's going to be the best thing ever so then um but you know for instance with the ed sheeran order the bottles went missing so yeah. you know on the way to dusseldorf I almost had to drive to Dusseldorf. Yeah. And that feeling of like the company, you know, that feeling like it was existential. Like, mm-hmm. You know, if we let this down, then this is, you know, our big, our big opportunity is gone. Big break. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So you're talking about, you know, expecting wild success. What does wild success look like for you? Um, we've, we've, we try and temper our ambitions a little bit because they, they do sometimes get a bit out of, out of control, but like. At least yeah. outside the com- this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you know, we really do want to build sort of the world's largest consumer brand for the ocean. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, there's no, there's no like Nike for the ocean out there, right? Like Nike's for athletes, but there's no brand like Nike for the ocean. But then we have this whole tech layer as well, which enables other brands to become brands for the ocean as well. So it's it's kind of interesting now in the world of technology how that enables us to just exponentially grow our impact i suppose which is what we're here to do um but yeah the ambitions are big uh but you know you read shoe dog and you're like it's kind of you know these things take time so you've got to be a bit patient you know the, the overall ambition i guess is to put ourselves out of business you know to collect so much plastic to have such an impact on on you know plastic collection and the circularity that there's no there's no need there's no need to do it and we have to move on to something else so if people don't change their behavior how long will it take, if ever, given the pace now? Gosh, if I had a crystal ball, what to, that's the... to, to figure it out, the, the rate of plastic flowing into the ocean is accelerating. Mm-hmm. The problem is getting much worse, much faster. Mm-hmm. Then people think, again, back to the plastic bag and the straw, that we're making huge progress. We're really, really not. Mm-hmm. We're massively behind the curve. So how many of the bottles do you need to make in order to keep up with the plastic waste in the ocean? So we recently, we did a, a sort of a nomination form that we had to fill out and we did a whole analysis around like, okay, what impact could we make over the next couple of decades? And the market that we're in, so both on like impact products and hardware, but also impact technology and software is so big that in theory, we as a company could fund the collection of all ocean land plastic within the next few decades. Like whether or not we're going to do that is a completely different question. But even if we could do, you know, a huge chunk of that, mm-hmm. that would be be brilliant. And I think 
Um, also, if, if other companies come along and, and, you know, do similar things and, um, or, you know, we drive some inspiration here or there, I think that would be an amazing outcome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, we're definitely not a one-stop solution for the whole problem. That's not no, what we'd ever claim to be. I think there's so many other solutions out there that are all tying together to build this ecosystem that will come up with the long-term solution. I guess my, my question isn't so much about like putting you on the spot and saying, well, you know, you're going to fix the world. It's more about putting the problem in context for individuals to figure out, well, like we need to do something about this. We can't just sort of sit there and sip on our Evian bottles. Like we, you know, even reducing them is, is like, it's not enough because there's just so much out there. Um, mm. Well, I think in a way, you know, it does come back to there's a few things that, that you can do. And it, again, it's, you know, lobby mm-hmm. government and, and the people that you're actually voting for, like, yeah. get actively involved because can and stick. I mean, they can really shift things quite quickly. Um, but then, yeah, as, as an individual, like who, who are you buying products from? You know, what, what initiatives can you can you get behind? I mean, the whole reason why we created our company was so that individuals can actually create an outsized impact. So, you know, come on board, get involved with, with what we're up to. Um, but then I think it's like actually the, the, the company that you work for, you can have a huge impact um, either if it's your company, you know, the company that you're employed by, if they can make a big change, mm-hmm. yeah, that can be monumental. Mm-hmm. Um, so we found that that kind of like, the internal sustainability champions, yeah, they're, they're real change makers, actually. Yeah. I think the companies like Nestle or Danone or, you know, Unilever, having real sustainability champions in those companies, I think if you work at one of those companies and, you know, you're worried about your work and, you know, it, aligning with your values, know that you could actually have a massively outsized impact by lobbying people within that organization. And the sustainability people in those companies are actually incredibly important mm. for, for driving change. Mm. So I think it just, you know, it depends on your your context and, mm. and where you are. That makes a lot of sense. I'd like to talk more about your partnership because, and this is something that we're talking about earlier, because I find it very fascinating about how business partners end up working successfully together. And you mentioned that you both met at London Business School. Did you deliberately choose each other or how did you know that you were the right business partners for each other? Good question. Good question. Did you? Good question. <laughs> mm. Well, you know, I think it was serendipitous. We were sat next to each other. So it wasn't like, um, and you know, that allowed us for that whole semester, we were sat together for Chatting every, lesson, every right? core lesson. Yeah, so it was just talking, talking, talking. And I think, and then we went on a road trip Yes. Down Highway One, we went to Silicon Valley to see to meet with a lot of the tech companies over there with the university. And on that road trip, you know, a lot of the ideas, pretty much every idea that we came up has now materialized mm-hmm. from that road trip, which is actually the, an NFC smart chip in every bustle. Because after Silicon Valley, we were like, well, we we have to that connectivity and network effects. Yeah, and everything that's came so apparent. To, you know, you you got to build your own platform to speak to people, and so. Being able to identify who's got every bottle is, is such a big part of that. Um, but I think it was just values alignment and just, you know, what we wanted from it and how we thought and everything. I think it just, you know, I think the way we challenge each other's, you know, one of the biggest strengths that we have as a mm. partnership. Mm. And I think the partnership, I think having a successful co-founder partnership is so integral to, you know, we have so many people that we know that um, that fell apart at some point and you know the company doesn't or if there's any sort of sense of tension or misalignment between two founders um you know the team knows you know the team knows everything about what's going on they can sense everything so i think actually making sure that you know there is real alignment and you you know you're you're going in the same direction uh is is such an important part Mm. of of the co-founder partnership so how are you different we are, yeah, we're kind of, we're similar and different, I would say. Like, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of our values, what we want to achieve, I think we really, if we disagree, and yeah, we, God, we've had like a hell of a journey, mm-hmm. you know, like the two of us. Like, we were living in my parents' basement at one point. That's really? Like, <laughs> in Norway. Mm-hmm. And I'm working, we didn't even see the daylight. We, we actually, for, for like three, four months, I think it was crazy. 
is <laughs> to me that was crazy but well he grew up with that so. yeah i'm used to it um but you know it's it, it's been a crazy journey and i think there's a lot of stuff that we could you know look back on and go wow we you know we've got through these all these different challenges that we faced like together um but it is make or break i think having a co-founder is also a game changer because you can not only can you share the burdens because that's fundamentally that you know you're carrying all these like burdens just on your shoulder that no one else in your life can relate to no yeah you know, especially you know we don't we were young we were really young i mean we were 23 and yeah. we started and um yeah so not only can you share those burdens but also you can share the successes mm -hmm. and i think we've not been very good at sharing the successes because i think often you know, we're always thinking about the next thing that, that needs to be done and, you know, we're never done. But every now and then, I think we have kind of stopped up and and, and done that. But it's also, I think, you know, sharing learnings and being, we're both very willing to be wrong. We're both very willing to learn why we were wrong and how we we're wrong and learn from that. And I think that process together has been really exciting because as we've been, we started at ground zero together and we've kept up with each other. There's not been like a, you know, one person is sort of, thrive more than the other or 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 you know once one person is like this isn't for me we've both been fully committed since day one and it's i think that's what's been really exciting to, just to share the journey as well pretty awesome actually and like that that journey of leadership i mean we're still not i don't know where we are probably five out of ten or something <laughs> but like, there's still a long way to go and but i think yeah that you know we'll try our values are very aligned we'll challenge each other if we don't see something the same way until we basically bash each other until we kind of do see it in the same way or we end up with some kind of compromise or, or something yeah. um, or, or one of us agrees with the other one. Uh, How often does that happen? Uh, probably every week. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. there's small things all the way up to, you know, like I think the, the high level ambition is, has never really changed. I think we yeah, set exactly. that in the beginning and that's sort of been the North Star and it was, the, the agreement is how best to get there. Mm -hmm and yeah it happens on time i mean it's i think it's it's got to happen you're talking about bashing like bash, bash each other like what does that, that, look, that look like exactly yeah. Yeah, so we're on a phone call and we're like we're being really honest about yeah. what we think about this yes. you know it's like and we've had some very long phone calls well i mean it's <laughs> incredibly long phone calls. Yeah. but the, with that honesty and being able to be honest with each other is mm. so critical because mm. if you're not and there's something that's been left unsaid then and I think the only person I have that relationship with 100 percent is probably well you know apart from my girlfriend yeah and you know too. again I think that we were saying earlier that we need to give a shout out to our girlfriend yeah. for being yeah. so incredible so shout out to Charlie and, and, shout out to me yeah, uh, for really being the the yin to this yang of this partnership of this being like a really sort of fast moving dynamic you know we've got to you know what are we going to do to to get to where we need to get to to mm. achieve this vision of of really making um you know a company that that makes difference mm. but also the yang to you know all the fallout that that comes from that not not personal fallout mm. necessarily at all but like more you know you know i think we do beat ourselves up and to will's point of not accelerating the wins i think that's actually once we get the win it doesn't feel like a win because you know we it was already been in our minds we're, we're already thinking about what's next it's quite common for entrepreneurs because it's almost like it's never good enough until it reaches the stage where you feel like that's my ultimate success mm. but in order to get there you know it does wear you out very quickly when you are not sort of stopping and sort of patting yourself on the back and saying look we've got there that's just another notch to kind of like put your foot onto that you can then step up and continue climbing yeah, I mean, a good example of that was we had our first ever out of home campaign this Christmas, and we we always wanted to do one. We were like billboards on the tube. How amazing would that be? And we finally did it. And um, I think we, you know, we did take a little pinch ourselves moment, mm -hmm. like, wow, and like we've actually this is this is happening. Mm -hmm. um, but then it kind of, you know, now we've done another one three months later, and we're like. That's just uh, yeah, that's you know, sort of BAU you now, sort of business as usual. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so it does, it does, and even now, I don't think we, you know, we didn't really, you know, we didn't take like a day out to get into all the cheap map and like, right, <laughs> look, you know, really sort of basket. So, so funny. Actually, that's we actually were on an out of home campaign that wasn't ours. We were on Tide Banks out of home <laughs> campaign, and it was like, and they told us where to go and when to see our, you know, 
their uh, ad about us banking with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, you know, it had us in a quote from us. And we went and we, could, <laughs> we, told, we, told, uh, we told the tube to try and find it and it wasn't there. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. But we had photos. People were sending us photos of us on it, but then we couldn't find it ourselves. <laughs> oh. But the, the reason why I was start talking about how you guys deal with your conflict is that one of the biggest red flags for me is when you don't argue at all. And I think quite often when you don't have those challenging conversations and you don't, you know, kind of call yourselves out and trying to like try to see the other person's perspective, um, that's when you end up in a situation where you're like, actually, we're completely in the, you know, thinking about it in a different way there's no even point in having a conversation and then you just sort of like walk away so that ability to deal with disagreement and being honest as you said i think that makes a massive difference which is probably why you're still working together yeah. <laughs> i think i think i think, think, so, yeah. I think it's that shared <laughs> end goal like not the yeah. not the end goal for the company ourselves it's like so. you know what, what are we trying to what are we striving yeah. for as division what are we you know trying to get the collective company mm. uh, towards. And I think we're both happy to compromise for that yeah. end vision. Mm-hmm. So then because we share that, then exactly. it's, it's yeah, it's fine. Mm. And also making a, a, a quick bad decision is often making better than making a good decision. So, you know, we've learned that. it's just, you know, if, if you can't agree, just make a decision and, and, and move on. And mm-hmm. just, as long as you both are committed to that decision and, and mm-hmm. own it, then that's you know that's better than deliberating for hours like, like we used to deliberate yeah. a lot more yeah. mm-hmm. what advice would you give to other you know entrepreneurs who are looking to create a business when choosing who to partner with um it's always difficult giving advice because i think every situation is unique um and you know no two pairs of co-founders are the same uh, but I think that shared vision is going to be really, really tough. Like either if you're, no matter where you know, where we are now, it's still going to be a nightmare for the next, you know, probably a little while. Um, and so I think having, you know, being a hundred percent committed, be, both being a hundred percent committed, I think mm. is so key because like we said, then you're willing to compromise on other things to make sure that, you know, it's going to happen. Yeah. The reason why you get out of bed needs to be the same because it needs, because you need to be in that same rhythm as well. Like you need to be in that same cadence of like, you know, feeling like things are good enough or things aren't, you know, things need to be faster or whatever. And if you, if you're missing a beat on that sort of thing, then, you know, it's, I think that's where f- tempers get frayed. And yeah. Get- yes. And, but I think it's, it's hard to also know straight away, you know, if it is, if it is the right, uh, match and partner, right? Because, mm-hmm. If you don't have a lot of information to go off, if you just met them, how, how do you know? So I think that's the thing as well as I think, you know, spending that time together and, um, you know, really both being very open about like trying to see if this this is something that works for both of us. Like, is this something that you, are, you know, you really want to get into? Um, I mean, when you quit your job, I was like, 100 <laughs> percent, you know, this, this is go time. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, you, you're not going to know that overnight either. Mm. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of testing and learning and, you know, I think you do have to be quite agile, especially at the mm-hmm. beginning about, you know, whether it works, you need to find that hundred percent alignment. Mm-hmm. And then if you don't find it, then I know so many people that have walked away from companies after two, three years mm-hmm. and it was a misalignment that they knew in their gut at the beginning but didn't want to admit to themselves. And then what the, the whole proposition didn't work. Because mm-hmm. of it. Yeah, I mean, just being honest with yourself as well when mm-hmm. it's not working makes a difference. Mm-hmm. There's someone out there for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> what we were talking about earlier about having this sort of like matching for entrepreneurs mm-hmm. and like trying to figure out what, what works and what doesn't. Uh, it's a massive, it makes a massive difference to the success of the business. I mean, if you've got, you know, incredible founders who can keep each other afloat when things are not going so well, but also can push you and challenge you and make you see a different angle to what you can't see 
I mean, being a founder on your own is is hard. Like you're talking about wanting to have, you know, that peer that understands the unique challenges that you go through. Like dealing with that on your own is incredibly difficult. Mm. I mean, it's already very lonely. Yeah. I think the other thing we found has been really valuable recently, which we didn't even know existed, is there are some founder networks out there. Um, and, you know, those are places that you can meet people who either been through what you're going to go through so you can learn from them or you meet people that are going to go through what you've been through so you can you know share <laughs> share a couple of tips and tricks and and you know I, I would really recommend to seek those out because peer-to-peer -peer founder learning uh, can actually be much more valuable than learning from someone who hasn't done it before mm. um but also having mentors who haven't done it before and have a completely different like business perspective can also be you know hugely valuable so kind of seeking both i think is is mm. awesome i think the 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 obvious thing about choosing a founder that hasn't actually been mentioned is oh, yeah. that you can't there does need to be a yin and yang element to it i think mm -hmm. we were very young and didn't really you know have any experience but i had studied history before i went to lbs and will had studied engineering but actually we've swapped so I do all the maths side of the business. Okay. Will does all the sort of brain creative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, you know, I think we, and I think we developed that yin yang. I think it wasn't necessarily so obvious at the beginning, but then through, you know, it became very obvious whose roles are what very quickly. And um, so is a deliberate so decision to try to fit in your natural skills and strengths into the different roles that are required for the business is that what you try to do yeah i think you know i think while we studied the wrong degrees for, for what we're doing uh it was definitely just whatever feels natural and we were lucky i don't think we necessarily considered that going in i think that may have been an element of luck mm. um about that sort of yin and yang mm. i can't mm. even remember it for you really no, I don't, I don't I don't think so we just fumble our way into that 100 yeah. percent and you know we're so we're co-founders and co-CEOs so we really share that responsibility um and there's a, you know there's a lot of things that will we've got two heads which is great if I'm stuck on a problem I can ask Nick you know what do you think about this and vice versa um but yeah I think that might natural split of leaning into your strengths because there's no point in doing you know if you can't do something, you can hire, we were talking about this, you can hire someone who's got a better skill set yeah. than you. We found this time and time again. I mean, our team uh, in so many facets are better than us, at most of the stuff that we've previously done. Um, so, you know, hiring that team around you to, to, you know, build on those skill sets that you don't have uh, and then leaning into your strengths. I think that's the, the key thing. Don't like. Yeah, the last thing you give up as a founder should be the, very best thing that you're at yeah you know, totally, yes so we're sort of whistling away at things at the moment hiring people to replace us in all sorts of places and what is that what is the this best the best thing that you're each the best at we might have to have a separate session <laughs> <laughs> to, <laughs> she think, to have to figure that out i don't know and she don't know i mean um nick's very like you're very sort of pragmatic and you know for example we were going into covid um i was like wait it's all gonna be fine um and nick said you know we really need to like batten our matches because this is going to be a rough ride and luckily we then subsequently did that which otherwise i think it could have been pretty bad mm -hmm. um i on the other hand i don't know <laughs> i think will is is sort of very incredibly high energy brand focused you know i think we're going to need to you're going to be seeing a lot more of will in the coming years and uh you know i think we need to basically get him on a sort of tour bus a campaign bus around <laughs> around the world making sure that the the gospel of of uh ocean plastic cleanup is 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 heard um uh, high alert basically i think that's all in any relationship like romantic relationships like business relationship like the other person is like a mirror to you right you get triggered when having some sort of a conflict and that forces you to think about what is the thing that's causing you distress. And on the flip side, it's also what are you good at? And maybe something that you didn't even realize the other person can help to highlight that. So I feel like that balance, that relationship, that ability to kind of take feedback 
and to also give that to the other person is hugely beneficial. Completely. And I think I think we've been much better at doing that rec- in recent mm-hmm. times than, than previously. Like, mm-hmm. you know, Nick's been amazing at the commercial expansion of the business since the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Is now, you know, really leading on that and also more willing to make, you know, some big shakeups and changes than sometimes I am. Um, but then vice versa, I'm sometimes willing to do something more great. It's funny that yeah, yeah. about it. Mm. But yeah, I think absolutely. I think on our side of the business, we're willing to make bigger risks because that's, you know, I think that's our nature is when we're, we're very risk, you know, hungry, I think. Whereas, but when it's sort of the other side of the business where you don't necessarily know, you can feel a little bit more like cagey about it and be like, well, why are we taking that risk? You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Sort of thing. Yeah. So I think that is a natural challenge that we give to each other. Um, you know, sometimes we can be a little bit too idealistic about what's possible and, you know, what we can do. Sometimes we do need to be reined in a little bit and, you know, that feedback. But our feedback is actually very honest and, like, it can be very direct. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, I think we're still learning about how to give feedback to that's most effective to the team because everyone's so different, you know, and everyone is so, so different. Everyone takes feedback and that's a really big part of being a leader is understanding that seeing that and being able to address that mm. in, a, in a unique way um but our you know we f- allow each other to be quite direct which i think is necessary just because we're hard on ourselves as well well there's there's no reason not to be you're just sort of lying to yourselves if you're not mm. so your co-ceos how are your leadership styles different good question good question Good question. I um, I don't know. I think you know, like like Nate said. I think actually, uh, one of the things we've really been working on recently is is feedback because the team deserve it. Um, so I think that's something that we you know we're both trying to really push on. Um, I mean, key dif- I don't know in terms of key differences. I think um, there probably are some. I think I think the the fundamental one I think is will lead with emotion and like you yes know, getting people up for stuff and i'll lead with reason so i will you know tell people why we're doing something or what's the logic behind it you know how we're going to get there how do we win that sort of thing mm-hmm. um but will is very much like you know um getting everyone pumped up and you know driving people forward you know and it is such an important part of it it's like you know if everyone feels if everyone feels like everyone resonates with each other and we're, we're on a mission it can't just be uh, the nuts and bolts it needs to be sort of feeling unified mm. as well and what does leadership mean to you you know it's it's certainly not management um i think leadership is is different and um you know i think sometimes as leaders we slip into management where you know we're, we're probably too involved in something you know giving too much feedback or or uh, not letting the, the team really fly. Um, and I think leadership is about, uh, again, you know, sending that vision in, in many ways and then letting the the team deliver that that vision. Um, that's my own view. But, but it's hard. That's very hard in practice, I think, because, mm-hmm. you know, um, people across the team are different. People have different needs. Different um, communication styles, different exactly. listening styles. You know, it, it's not often, yourself you know, comedian. yeah, communicating vision, mm-hmm. you know, you can feel like you've communicated it very well um, by telling them, but some people need to see it. Some people need to, you know, th- there's some people really understand it like that and some people will. Um, so you need to adapt your communication style to different people as well. So that's another sort of aspect, I guess that's, that's a tactic of leadership, not really like the, the overarching um, part of it, but it. It is also allowing people to believe the more is possible. I think it's such an important part. I think what we're both very strong at, I think, is for things to not ever be enough and things can always be better. Things can always be bigger. And it's just showing people that, you know, unlocking that part of them that that will aspire to to achieve more and, and not just stay at that sort of, you know, plateau. Mm. I think, and and sometimes where we've perhaps fallen short is uh, not having that supreme clarity around what we want to achieve, because that can then leave people doing, you know, 
you know, it's like someone said uh, the other day, you wouldn't build a building without an architect because you might come into that building and go, oh, what's that, you know, what's that pile on there in the, in the middle of the building um, that you hadn't intended for, for, to be there? So I think, you know, being supremely clear in terms of what you want to achieve and then getting everyone like fired up about that, I think is important. And it, is, it is building that foundation of like the how, how you're going to get mm -hmm. there is not always um, super clear it. because it's, it's, a, it's very difficult and we always don't have the answers again to the point of mm -hmm. we hire people who are better than us at figuring that sort of stuff out. Mm -hmm. um, and also that yearly step, you know, figuring out that yearly steps, you know, ladder to get to that overall vision of, of you know, our, our mission is to collect 7 billion plastic bottles in weight by 2025. Um, and we need to keep, you know, looking at that the whole time. It's never that the job of setting that vision is never done and it needs to be nurtured. And sometimes I think uh, we have let that slip a little bit, but we're, we're, we're hopefully getting better. Exactly. Exactly. I think we've come around full circle on that. And it's about, yeah, how, you know, how can we look at that huge problem and actually go, right, well, we're going to take a massive chunk out of that by doing this. Mm. Um, and, and I think, yeah, the sky's the limit. So it's sort of just making sure that people mm. believe that and then it becomes kind of, you know, self-fulfilling in a way. Yeah. Well, your mission is very ambitious. And, you know, you're clearly are talking about energy and bringing like a lot of emotion. And, you know, everyone has their downtimes. How do you maintain that energy when you might not feel like it? Yeah, and I suppose we have our downtimes, but also the team you know, has their downtimes. When are they most receptive to that energy and things like that? I think it's very difficult. I think you know sometimes you come in on a Monday and you're having a bad Monday, and you know actually recognizing that and just going, okay, do you know what? today is going to be a day and tomorrow is going to, you know, starting afresh tomorrow. So I think it, it's not humanly possible to bring that every single day. Um, and I think also you, it'd be a bit tiring for the team if you like brought that energy every single day, actually. So it's, it's, it's probably a good thing to give people a bit of a break. But I do think, you know, if you can find those opportunities and take them, um, which I think is something we're both getting better at, to like spark the team and, and, you know, get them fired up about something in particular, it, I think is great. And then, you know, also the team can't be a hundred percent all the time, you know, just don't beating yourself up. Don't beat yourself up. If the team are a bit down one day, mm. like everyone just came back from the Easter break, you know, it's going to be a bad Monday, isn't it? Yeah. You know, sort of, um, I suppose it's also showing that you're human. Like we can't be operating at high level energy a hundred percent of the time. Like things happen, like in our life, you know. Exactly. It ate too much at Christmas, or you know, didn't get enough sleep the night before, or you know, something happens in your family. So you know, it's it's only when that becomes chronic then that becomes an issue. But um, there's a lot of like social media stuff about founders and entrepreneurs, and you know getting up at 4 a.m., yes, going for like a 20 strong. mile run. And it's like, and painting them out, painting themselves out to be some sort of superhuman, which is just, you know, unattainment. But you and don't get up. But also, you know, exactly. It's like, no, like, we're like completely <laughs> normal people. And it's like, it was when I was out clinic and like, and probably yeah. being to an after party. <laughs> I don't think I've yeah. ever been up at 4.30 a.m. Except for when my second child was born and he was waking yeah, up at that enough. time and i was like i would not not go to sleep for anything in the world apart from keeping my child alive <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's I'm, probably where it, i draw the line you know i think that that stuff is you know but that being told that you have to do this you have to do this i think is like yeah really destructive so damaging. and it makes you feel like oh, you know, you're not a great leader you're not you know ira game or whatever um I think you you know you just gotta like you know try and do one thing better at a time and yeah. constantly improve. Yeah, I'm really definitely not getting up at four thirty a.m. But yeah, I think you know you've got to. I think people just need to realize that you know the, those bad times you've got to embrace them and just like roll with them. Mm -hmm. And you know if you we've, I've got a new mantra this this year, which is enjoy the ride, which is I think mm. you know I think 
sort of it is very cheesy it's something my girlfriend actually said to me um when i was having a particularly low moment and you know just one of those things of just you know you you have a great life like enjoy the ride just enjoy the moments and um good bad all of that exactly and you know it's it's, it's visceral though like being in the situation everything is so many ups and downs it's like such a big part of my life and when and we, we speak about this every now and then but when this is over it's over it's over and you know I'm going to crave those those low moments after because it's been such an incredible experience. But um, I do think that uh, people just beat themselves up and and just get lost in the moment of just I'm inadequate, I'm not doing anything, I'm not good enough. But, you know, all these people that we met, like all these founders that we met recently on this founders trip, you know, they're just real people. You know, mm -hmm. they're just normal people, mm -hmm. and they've got their issues, mm -hmm. they've got their problems. I mean, they've all got a couple of screws loose. That's yeah, exactly. But, I think. But. <laughs> There's some common threads, but it wasn't that they were getting up at 4 a.m. or they were superhuman at all. It was, yeah, very, very, very normal people. So what kind of messages do you want entrepreneurs to be hearing that are more empowering and more helpful? Yeah, I think um, one of the game changers for me was getting a therapist and a coach, honestly. Um, I think it got to the point where I felt that if I wasn't using my time on work, it was completely unproductive time. So it basically got to the point where it was like, I have to be working 24 seven and nothing else in my life kind of matters. And not going to our girlfriends felt balance us out a bit as well on that. But like, you know, that became pretty unhealthy. Um, and actually having someone to talk to a coach to set some goals around, um, yeah, around like your, you know, what what do you want to achieve? I'm a person that like wants to achieve everything immediately. Um, so actually going, okay, I'm what are we gonna actually try and achieve, you know, this quarter? Not setting goals that are like completely unrealistic. And then also looking at like your personal life, you know, what is it you want to achieve in your personal life? And then putting in practices that, you know, actually put some boundaries around work. And I think the game changer around that has been yeah, finding the joy in like actually now enjoying the ride, all the challenges, the ups and the downs, trying to then, you know, more often bring my best self to work and like actually being able to hopefully motivate the team and, and, you know, be a bit more inspirational than like, you know, just sort of coming in and, and, and trying to get literally just trying to hack at the day and like get mm. through. Um, and that, and it's, that's definitely still a journey Like you know, no, it's still not there, but I think, you know, look after yourself because, um, and that sounds super cheesy, but like that will actually pay dividends because, you know, you can't do everything, but if you can like show up as your best self and invest in your, in yourself, I think mm -hmm. it's really valuable. And you know, like that. really like that you're really giving a shout out to your girlfriends and talking about a balance like how do you feel that you are achieving that balance are you achieving a balance what do you think um do your girlfriends think that you're achieving the balance uh, well no one's ever going to be 100 percent happy yeah. you know i think that that is the nature of balance and compromise i think um but yeah the answer is yes far more than we used to i think but also I don't think we've become any less effective because of it. I think actually just being refreshed and coming into things with a fresh perspective and everything that comes with, you know, headspace, because headspace was probably lacking in the early days. Mm -hmm. I think we were just sort of so in our heads buried into it that it was hard to sort of see um, through the trees. But also, you know, there's so many aspects, so many facets to your life, including family, friends, and, you know, we would be lying if we were saying this wasn't sort of all still all consuming. Yeah. So I think, you know, I wake up and on a Saturday night at 4 a.m. and all I can think about is, is you know, the next week. I'm not going to pretend like that doesn't, that doesn't happen. It happens all the time. And, um, you know, I will somehow still drift off in a conversation with a friend and yeah. start thinking about, you know, work. Uh, but things are much much better than they used to be <laughs> and yet what yeah, made that change sense. happen or did something happen to force you to address that meeting charlie my girlfriend mm. i think i think it was sort of just you know 
um, you know, wanting to be less selfish. I think it was sort of a, a need to, um, you know, I don't think I necessarily thought I was being selfish because I was so, but I was probably so wrapped up in Ocean Bottle that, you know, sort of single minded. Mm -hmm. And then meeting Charlie, sort of priority shifted. And, you know, again, I don't think I'm any less effective. I think I'm probably better at my job than now. And um, it's just giving new perspective. And she's able, you know, she knows me better than anyone, apart from maybe Will. And, you know, she's able to see how things affect me and, and coach me on that and, and tell me, you know, when I'm overstepping or, or going too far on something mm. or when I need a break. Yeah, and she's a teacher, so that, that's, mm. that always helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's got um, incredible perspective. And it's just nice having, you know, someone's life that I care about just as much as my own and, you know, speaking about her life and how it's, you know, how it's different and giving me new perspective on something that is uh, just as important to me. And, mm. you know, so I'm, I'm basically living vicariously through her as well. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, I was just going to say, it's, yeah, very, very similar for me. And I think... Um, yeah, I kind of, I want to show up as like my best self and actually be present because that's been one of the biggest issues is like, I'm literally just daydreaming about work 24 mm. seven in my dreams <laughs> when I'm, you know, at dinner, with, uh, everywhere. And I think, <clears throat> you know, being, being present uh, is, is really important. Um, so I really wanted to do that. Yeah. Also for Megan, um, and, but it's still hard, you know, you, you, particularly if you're, you know, working from home, how, when do you finish work? Like it's, it's done somewhere. If you don't have plans, you know, if you haven't planned something, almost. Or if you don't have like a forced stop, like having to pick up your kids from school. So, it's, you know, so then, it, then it does just drift on. And, and also, I, you know, I think it's safe to say that I still have, you know, I still fall down the rabbit hole mm. quite often in that I'll have, probably a couple of days a week where I'm like just still in the weeds and you know kind of lost you know you, you lose yourself a bit um but it's better than it was building a business which is has such high aspirations and such big goals it doesn't happen overnight so in order for you to maintain the energy and maintain the enthusiasm and to be able to kind of take the knocks you also need to have a longer vision of how you manage your own mental state, your physical state. In the beginning, you just want to do it all. And it doesn't matter if you're like staying at your computer for 24 hours, but you cannot maintain that over years and decades. So scaling that back is in your own benefit because I think sometimes there is this fear that if I stop, mm. then either the energy will go, the enthusiasm will stop and I just won't mm. pick it up. So it doesn't actually necessarily come from a good place. It comes from a place of fear and anxiety as opposed to like, I've done this thing now. Maybe I'm not at my best. I need to go work out. I need to go and have you know sleep. I need to see a friend to kind of like, you know, reconnect, form a better bond. And all of those things that sometimes in the beginning we think that actually don't improve us and improve our businesses is the key to longevity and maintaining the sense of wonder that you had in the beginning. So I think if you can learn that lesson earlier, then that will put you in good stead for the long term. I completely agree. And I think, you know, also prioritize it to prioritization, um, you know, prioritizing the things that actually matter. Because in that mindset, you're kind of like, oh, I, you know, I have to do everything. And actually you might, Two thirds of that might have been almost completely pointless, whereas you could have done a third of it really, really well. Um, but yeah, I, I read an article the other day about it was someone who had was starting a vineyard, uh, and they developed they were developing a hundred year business plan. Oh wow! How nice would that be to kind of have that like luxury of time and just mm. think? You know, it's building block by building block, yeah, multi generational. Exactly. So maybe we all need a, a spice of that. Isn't it funny? It's like, you know, thinking about death and because we're talking about 100 years, I mean, it's like, will this person even be alive, right? But with a lot of things in life, they're so polarizing. On the one hand, knowing that you can die at any moment can be so energizing and, you know, can be like, okay, I just, you know, this could be the last day, so I need to make the most of it. 
But at the same time, knowing that you might live to be 100, 120, then you can really pace yourself and take things in your stride and not to have to like rush so much. So both have a benefit and both have the pros and cons. The important part on that longevity piece is that I think we both committed to ourselves and each other that if there's someone better at our job than us, that we walk away. You know, I don't think we're not, you know, I think we're so bought into the mission and the purpose that if there is someone who can do this better than us, that we will mm -hmm. step out and, and let them do that and not not sort of stand in their way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's such an important part of of that journey and planning our personal plan of, of you know, keeping that energy. It's like, you know, if, if for whatever reason, we're no longer the best person that I think, and you can walk away, then, you know, I think there's a feeling like some founders feel like they're trapped because... Mm -hmm. They, you know, it's it's either them or, or no one. Um, but, you know, I think we made that quite hard. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, you know, and hopefully we'd still be, you know, a decent part of the furniture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we'll still have purpose. Still, still yeah. around for, you know, for, for forever. Looking back at 2017, you know, looking to create this business, like what advice would you give those younger selves back then? What do you think? I would say, so if I was to pick a couple of things, I would say prioritize, prioritize ruthlessly. You don't try and do everything. Honestly, we were being told that at the start and I kind of didn't believe it because you feel like you have to do everything, but genuinely like you really, really try and be very critical and, and prioritize. Um, I would say stick to your, like stick to your guns and your, your purpose, like don't stray from yeah, you know, what you've set out to do like that that i think that's really important um because things will knock you things will test you the whole way mm -hmm. sticking to that's good um and then i would say you know take time to celebrate those small wins i think mm -hmm. um you know revel in those little moments and and the person who sat next to me in our in our first office which wasn't even an office it was literally a cupboard uh she came up with this thing of like putting post-its on the wall mm -hmm. you know every time she had a small win and it could literally be like something as small as her first customer mm -hmm. which is actually quite a big thing mm -hmm. you know um or or whatever but i think that that's important mm -hmm. yeah i i think i wouldn't want to mess with the naivety of of our younger selves too much um and i would probably just say you know again live in the moment Yes. Enjoy the ride, sort of that sort of message. Cause I think, you know, such a special moment. That early stage is, is just incredible. It's it's so fun. I think it's, you might not think about it like that at the time. Yeah. It was a, you know, I think it's, um, you know, figuring things out and then those four wins and like, you know, getting that first customer. And I think it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of problems to solve mm -hmm. and it's sort of so fast paced. But I think, yeah, similar point to Will, if, if it was a sort of pragmatic answer and that would be strategy is just about, just as much about what you don't do as what you do do. Mm. I think making sure that you, you are cutthroat with, with prioritization and just chopping stuff out that shouldn't be there or, or can be left to later or is the next test, just concentrate on probably just one thing and really win on that point. Mm. No, really good advice. And my last question, what seems impossible to you now, but should you achieve it, will change the course of your life or your business? Um, I, mean, I think it, you know, if if the company could kind of run it itself for for a while, that would be, pretty, that'd be, you know, talk about like freezing time, you know, that would be a pretty incredible achievement. I think if we were able to, you know, hire a team that could, could, um, and you know, I, I think I think to a great degree, actually, the, the team is so capable that they could that it could run itself. Um, but I suppose there's there's a big part of that that's on our, us as well. You know, being able and willing to like um, completely hand over the reins, which I think is difficult when you've built it. Mm. But that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, difficult. I think um, um, impossible. But if we achieved it, I think it's, it's, does anything really feel 
I guess it, it is it is that sort of thing of of getting the company into such an incredible place that you know we are but it doesn't seem impossible I, I don't know it's sort of That's it's okay. an interesting question it's like <laughs> it's like I was going to say you know um get it to that size or sign 10,000 brands up to join the the race but also I feel I really feel like that is possible so that um, yeah it's not going to be easy but it's I think it's possible yeah I think I think um I think for me personally it is really truly living by that you know live in the moment be present mm. i think if i could really do that if i was really zen had a lot of headspace mm. i do feel like that is impossible for me personally i think that i really struggle with that and really be able to separate my you know carpet mental lives between family life friends charlie work and if i could do that and i really excelled at that then that would be a that would be the number one game changer for me I think I might actually have to pivot and, and shout. So. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't really mm. Yeah. I am with you on that one too. Like knowing how to do that is, you know, an amazing skill in life. And it's hard. I think it's it's something that I'm not sure you ever really get there. I think it's something that you learn bit by bit throughout your life and figure out what's important and like you said, like the things that you're just not going to do. Because I don't know if you've read this book and I, I talk about it quite a lot actually. It's called The 4,000 Weeks by Oliver Berkman. So 4,000 weeks is the number of weeks we have in our lifetime. And one of the things he talks about is this idea of, you know, putting rocks in the jar. And it's like, you know, this whole thing, like put the small rocks in first, put the big rocks in first and the small ones in the sand. And he's like, well, that analogy doesn't really work because you're not choosing between medium rocks and big rocks. You're choosing between huge rocks of your life. Mm. And because we don't have enough time really on earth to do everything, mm -hmm. you have to be very selective about what those big rocks are. And I think that's the hardest thing of all. But when you can make that decision, it's just, just things just flow. Mm. But to be able to like split yourself up into so many different things, it's, it's, mm. It's impossible. I think it's really hard because I'd be like, yeah, we can do all the big rocks, you know, we can, we can, and that is a problem, isn't it? You know, if you if you end up trapped in that. Um, and another good book I've been reading recently, which is I'm still reading since January, which shows you the the pace that I've been able to read at, um, is Think Like a Monk by mm -hmm. Julie Chassis. Yeah, and, and um, that you know, a lot of those books really talk about you know being present, and I think. If we could all be a bit like the Dalai Lama, you know, he's maybe he's too zen. Mm. Um, but but I think that that's a real like you yeah. know a real goal. It'd be pretty incredible. I was telling you about the books and how reading lots of books in succession. When you're reading subsequent books, you kind of see them through the lens and the filter of the previous ones. And there is a book called Emotional Agility by Susan David, who I would love to interview on this podcast, and she talks about you know, emotions being data, something that, you know, there is no such thing as being negative or positive, that everything is just information for you. And in the, at least in the English language or in humanity, we divide emotions into, you know, like sadness, anger, guilt, shame. And there are more words for negative, quote unquote, emotions as opposed to positive. And actually there is no such thing. And, you know, talking about Jay Shetty, think like a monk, meditation being present and I think our challenge as humans is just being able to accept things as they are and not to put them into categories like this is good and this is bad it's just is and to be able to sit in those emotions and to accept them for what they are and I think you know all of these teachings are really basically bring you back to the same point um but I can talk to you for ages and I have many um, recommendations for book, one of which is Four Futures, talking about capitalism and environmental um, breakdown of our world. But, um, but I'd like to thank you so much for coming onto the show, for talking about your business, sharing your you know, business partnership insights and uh, it's just been fascinating talking to you. So thank you. No, thank you so much for having us. Where's the best place to find you guys? Like where do we go and what do we do? Well, the number one place there to is without our website. So it's uh, oceanbottle.co. 
uh, which apparently is what all the challenger brands are using now. So, we, you know, we're one of those. Uh, and then if you go to Instagram and follow at Ocean Bottle as well, you can, you know, learn more about our journey and, and what we're up to. You can also come find us on LinkedIn um, as well. We're, we're also there. Brilliant. Perfect. Thanks for watching. Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What were your takeaways? And if you haven't already, I'd love for you to subscribe and follow this podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode.